you can share us with a friend. This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters and by Mortar and Pestles. Tonight, we'll read from The Complete Herbal, written by Nicholas Culpepper, published in 1653. Culpepper was an English botanist, herbalist, physician, and astrologer. Culpepper cataloged hundreds of outdoor medicinal herbs. He attempted to make medical treatments more accessible to lay persons by educating them about maintaining their health. Ultimately, his ambition was to reform the system of medicine by questioning traditional methods and knowledge and exploring new solutions for ill health. The systemization of the use of herbals by Culpepper was a key development in the evolution of modern pharmaceuticals, most of which originally had herbal origins. Culpepper's emphasis on reason rather than tradition is reflected in the introduction of his complete herbal. He was one of the best-known astrological botanists of his day, pairing the plants and diseases with planetary influences. Culpepper believed medicine was a public asset, not a commercial secret, and the prices physicians charged were far too high compared with the cheap and universal availability of nature's medicine. For this, he was considered a radical and even accused of witchcraft. Let's get cozy. Close your eyes. Relax your body into the softness of your bed. Now, take a few deep breaths. Directions for making syrups, conserves, etc. I have promised you the way of making syrups, conserves, oils, ointments, etc. out of herbs, roots, flowers, etc. whereby you may have them ready for your use at some times when they cannot be had otherwise. I come now to perform what I promised, and you shall find me rather better than worse than my word. Of leaves, of herbs, or trees. 1. Of leaves, choose only those such as are green and full of juice. Pick them carefully, and cast away such as any that are declining for they will putrefy the rest. So shall one handful be worth ten of those you buy at the medical herb shops. 2. Note what places they most delight to grow in, and gather them there. For betony that grows in the shade is far better than that which grows in the sun, because it delights in the shade so also such herbs as delight to grow near the water 
shall be gathered near it, though happily you may find some of them upon dry ground. The treatise will inform you where every herb delights to grow. 3. The leaves of such herbs as run up to seed are not so good when they are in flower as before. Some few accepted, the leaves of which are seldom or never used. In such cases, if through ignorance they were not known or through negligence forgotten, you had better take the top and the flowers than the leaf. 4. Dry them well in the sun and not in the shade, as the saying of physicians is. For if the sun draw away the virtues of the herb, it must need do the like by hay. By the same rule, which the experience of every country farmer will explode for a notable piece of nonsense. 5. Such as are artists in astrology, and indeed none else are fit to make physicians, such I advise. Let the planet that governs the herb be angular, and the stronger the better. If they can, in herbs of Saturn, let Saturn be in the ascendant. In the herbs of Mars, let Mars be in the mid-heaven, for in those houses they delight. Let the moon apply to them by good aspect, and let her not be in the houses of her enemies. If you cannot well stay till she apply to them, let her apply to a planet of the same triplicity. If you cannot wait that time neither, let her be with a fixed star of their nature. 6. Having well dried them, put them up in brown paper, sewing the paper up like a sack, and press them not too hard together, and keep them in a dry place near the fire. 7. As for the duration of dried herbs, a just time cannot be given. Let authors prate their pleasure for, first, such as grow upon dry grounds will keep better than such as grow on moist. Secondly, such herbs as are full of juice will not keep so long as such as are drier. Thirdly, such herbs as are well dried will keep longer than such as are slack dried. Yet you may know when they are corrupted by their loss of color or smell or both. And if they be corrupted, reason will tell you that they must needs corrupt the bodies of those people that take them. 4. Gather all leaves in the hour of the planet that governs them. Of Flowers 1. The flower, which is the beauty of the plant, and of none of the least use in medicine, grows yearly and is to be gathered when it is in its prime. 2. As for the time of gathering them, let the planetary hour and the planet they come of be observed, as we showed you in the foregoing chapter. As for the time of day, let it be when the sun shine upon them, that so they may be dry, for if you gather either flowers or herbs when they are wet or dewy, they will not keep. 3. Dry them well in the sun and keep them in papers near the fire as I showed you in the foregoing chapter. 4. 
So long as they retain the color and smell, they are good. Either of them being gone, so is the virtue also. Of Seeds 1. The seed is that part of the plant which is endowed with a vital faculty to bring forth its like, and it contains potentially the whole plant in it. 2. As for place, let them be gathered from the place where they delight to grow. 3. Let them be fully ripe when they are gathered, and forget not the celestial harmony before mentioned. For I have found by experience that their virtues are twice as great at such times as others. There is an appointed time for everything under the sun. 4. When you have gathered them, dry them a little, and but a little in the sun, before you lay them up. 5. You need not be so careful of keeping them so near the fire as the other before mentioned, because they are fuller of spirit, and therefore not so subject to corrupt. 6. As for the time of their duration, it is palpable they will keep a good many years, yet they are best the first year and this I make appear by a good argument. They will grow sooner the first year they be set, therefore, than they are in their prime, and it is an easy matter to renew them yearly. Of Roots 1. Of Roots Choose such as are neither rotten nor worm-eaten, but proper in their taste, color, and smell, such as exceed neither in softness nor hardness. 2. Give me leave to be a little critical against the vulgar received opinion, which is that the sap falls down into the roots in the autumn and rises again in the spring as men go to bed at night and rise in the morning. And this idle talk of untruth is so grounded in the heads, not only of the vulgar, but also of the learned, that a man cannot drive it out by reason. I pray let such sap mongers answer me this argument. If the sap falls into the roots in the fall of the leaf, and lies there all the winter, then must the root grow only in the winter. But the root grows not at all in the winter, as experience teaches, but only in the summer. Therefore, if you set an apple seed in the spring, you shall find the root to grow to a pretty bigness in the summer, and be not a whit bigger next spring. What doth the sap do in the root all that while? Pick straws? Tis as rotten as a rotten post. The truth is, when the sun declines from the tropic of cancer, the sap begins to congeal both in root and branch. When he touches the tropic of Capricorn, and ascends to usward, it begins to wax thin again, and by degrees, as it congealed. But to proceed. 3. The drier time you gather the roots in, the better they are, for they have the less excrementitious moisture in them. 4. Such roots as are soft. Your best way is to dry them in the sun, or else hang them in the chimney corner upon a string. As for such as are hard, you may dry them anywhere. 5. Such roots as are great will keep longer 
than such as are small, yet most of them will keep a year. 6. Such roots as are soft, it is your best way to keep them always near the fire and to take this general rule for it. If in winter time you find any of your roots, herbs, or flowers begin to be moist, as many times you shall, for it is your best way to look to them once a month. Dry them by a very gentle fire, or, if you can, with convenience, keep them near the fire, you may save yourself the labor. 7. It is in vain to dry roots that may commonly be had, as parsley, fennel, etc., but gather them only for present need. Of Barks 1. Barks Which physicians use in medicine are of these sorts, of fruits, of roots, of boughs. 2. The barks of fruits are to be taken when the fruit is full ripe, as oranges, lemons, etc. But because I have nothing to do with exotics here, I pass them without any more words. 3. The barks of trees are best gathered in the spring. If of oaks or such great trees, because then they come easier off, and so you may dry them if you please. But indeed, the best way is to gather all barks only for present use. 4. As for the barks of roots, tis thus to be gotten. Take the roots of such herbs as have a pith in them, as parsley, fennel, etc. Slit them in the middle, and when you have taken out the pith, which you may easily do, that which remains is called, though improperly, the bark, and indeed is only to be used. Of Juices 1. Juices are to be pressed out of herbs when they are young and tender, out of some stalks and tender tops of herbs and plants, and also out of some flowers. 2. Having gathered the herb, would you preserve the juice of it when it is very dry? For otherwise the juice will not be worth a button. Bruise it very well in a stone mortar with a wooden pestle. Then, having put it into a canvas bag, the herb I mean, not the mortar, for that will give but little juice, press it hard in a press, then take the juice and clarify it. 3. The manner of clarifying it is this. Put it into a pipkin or skillet or some such thing and set it over the fire. And when the scum arises, take it off. Let it stand over the fire till no more scum arise. When you have your juice clarified, cast away the scum as a thing of no use. 4. When you have thus clarified it, you have two ways to preserve it all the year. 1. When it is cold, put it into a glass and put not so much oil on it as it will cover it to the thickness of two fingers. The oil will swim at the top and so keep the air from coming into it. 
when you intend to use it, pour it into a porringer. And if any oil come out with it, you may easily scum it off with a spoon and put the juice you use not into the glass again. It will quickly sink under the oil. This is the first way. Two. The second way is a little more difficult, and the juice of the fruits is usually preserved this way. When you have clarified it, boil it over the fire till, being cold, it be of the thickness of honey. This is most commonly used for diseases of the mouth, and thus much for the first section. The second follows. Section 2. The way of making and keeping all necessary compounds. Chapter 1. Of Distilled Waters. Hitherto we have spoken of medicines which consist in their own nature, which authors vulgarly call simples, though sometimes improperly, for in truth nothing is simple but pure elements, all things else are compounded of them. We come now to treat of the artificial medicines, in the form of which, because we must begin somewhere, we shall place distilled waters in which consider 1. Waters are distilled of herbs, flowers, fruits, and roots. 2. We treat not of strong waters, but of cold. 3. The herbs ought to be distilled when they are in their greatest vigor, and so ought the flowers also. 4. The vulgar way of distillations which people use, because they know no better, is in a pewter still, and although distilled waters are the weakest of artificial medicines, and good for little, but mixtures of other medicines, yet they are weaker by many degrees than they would be if they were distilled in sand. If I thought it not impossible to teach you the way of distilling in sand, I would attempt it. 5. When you have distilled your water, put it into a glass covered over with a paper pricked full of holes, so that the excrementitious and fiery vapors may exhale, which cause that settling in distilled waters called the mother, which corrupt them. Then cover it close and keep it for your use. 6. Stopping distilled waters with a cork makes them musty, and so does paper, if it but touch the water. It is best to stop them with a bladder, being first put in water, and bound over the top of the glass. Such cold waters as are distilled in a pewter still, if well kept, will endure a year, such as are distilled in sand, as they are twice as strong, so they endure twice as long. Of Syrups A syrup is a medicine of the liquid form composed of infusion, decoction, and juice. And, one, for the more grateful taste, and two, for the better keeping of it with a certain quantity of honey or sugar, hereafter mentioned, boiled to the thickness of new honey. You see at the first view that this aphorism divides itself into three branches, which deserve severally to be treated of. One, syrups made by infusion, 
Two, syrups made by decoction. Three, syrups made by juice. Of each of these, for your instruction's sake, kind countrymen and women, I speak a word or two apart. First, syrups made by infusion are usually made of flowers, and of such flowers as soon lose their color and strength by boiling. As roses, violets, peach flowers, etc., they are thus made. Having picked your flowers clean, to every pound of them add three pounds or three pints, which you will, for it is all one, of spring water made boiling hot. First put your flowers into a pewter pot with a cover and pour the water over them. Then, shutting the pot, let it stand by the fire to keep hot twelve hours and strain it out in such syrups as purge as damask roses, peach flowers, etc., the usual, and indeed the best way, is to repeat this infusion, adding fresh flowers to the same liquor diverse times, that so it may be stronger. Having strained it out, put the infusion into a pewter basin, or an earthen one well glazed, and to every pint of it add two pounds of sugar, which being only melted over the fire, without boiling, and scummed, will produce you the syrup you desire. Syrups made by decoction are usually made of compounds, yet may any simple herb be thus converted into syrup. Take the herb, root, or flowers you would make into a syrup, and bruise a little. Then, boil it in a convenient quantity of spring water. The more water you boil in it, the weaker it will be. A handful of the herb or root is a convenient quantity for a pint of water. Boil it till half the water be consumed. Then let it stand till it be almost cold and strain it through a woolen cloth, letting it run out at leisure without pressing. To every pint of this decoction, add one pound of sugar and boil it over the fire till it come to a syrup, which you may know if you now and then cool a little of it with a spoon. Scum it all while the boiled water comes to the top and when it is sufficiently boiled, whilst it is hot. Strain it again through a woolen cloth, but press it not. Thus, you have the syrup perfected. Syrups made of juice are usually made of such herbs as are full of juice, and indeed, they are better made into a syrup this way than any other. The operation is thus. Having beaten the herb in a stone mortar with a wooden pestle, press out the juice and clarify it as you are taught before in the juices. Then let the juice boil away till about a quarter of it be consumed. To a pint of this, add a pound of sugar, and when it is boiled, strain it through a woolen cloth, as we taught you before, and keep it for your use. If you make a syrup of roots 
that are anything hard, as parsley, fennel, and grass roots are. When you have bruised them, lay them in steep some time in that water which you intend to boil them in hot. So will the virtue the better come out. Keep your syrups either in glasses or stone pots, and stop them not with cork nor bladder, unless you would have the glass break and the syrup lost. Only bind paper about the mouth. All syrups, if well made, continue a year with some advantage, yet such as are made by infusion keep shortest. Chapter 3 of Juleps Juleps were first invented, as I suppose, in Arabia, and my reason is because the word julep is an Arabic word. It signifies only a pleasant potion, as is vulgarly used by such as are sick and want help, or such as are in health and want no money to quench thirst. Nowadays, it is commonly used to prepare the body for purgation, to open obstructions and the pores, to digest tough humors, to qualify hot distempers. Simple juleps, for I have nothing to say to compounds here, are thus made. Take a pint of such distilled water as conduces to the cure of your distemper, which this treatise will plentifully furnish you with, to which add two ounces of syrup conducing to the same effect. Mix them together and drink a draught of it at your pleasure. If you love tart things, Add ten drops of oil of vitriol to your pint and shake it together, and it will have a fine, grateful taste. All juleps are made for present use, and therefore it is in vain to speak of their duration. Chapter 4 Of Decoctions all the difference between decoctions and syrups made by decoction is this. Syrups are made to keep. Decoctions are only for present use. For you can hardly keep a decoction a week at any time if the weather be hot, not half so long. Decoctions are made of leaves, roots, flowers, seeds, fruits, or barks, conducing to the cure of the disease you make for them, are made in the same manner as we showed you in syrups. Decoctions made with wine last longer than such as are made with water, and if you take your decoction to cleanse the passages or open obstructions, your best way is to make it with white wine instead of water, because this is penetrating. Decoctions are of most use in such diseases as lie in the passages of the body, because decoctions pass quicker to those places than any other form of medicines. If you will sweeten your decoction with sugar or any syrup it for the occasion you take it for, which is better, you may, and in no harm. If in a decoction you boil both roots, herbs, flowers, and seed together, let the roots boil a good while first, because they retain their virtue longest, then the next, 
in order by the same rule. Barks, the herbs, the seeds, the flowers, the spices, if you put any in, because their virtues come soonest out. Keep all decoctions in a glass closed stopped, and in the cooler place you keep them, the longer they will last. Lastly, the usual dose to be given at one time is usually two, three, four, or five ounces, according to the age and strength of the patient, the season of the year, the strength of the medicine, and the quality of the disease. Chapter 5 Of Oils Olive oil, which is commonly known by the name of salad oil, I suppose, because it is usually eaten with salads by them that love it, if it be pressed out of ripe olives, is temperate and exceeds in no one quality. Of oils, some are simple and some are compound. Simple oils are such as are made of fruits or seeds by expression, as oil of sweet and bitter almonds, linseed oil, etc., of which see in my dispensary. Compound oils are made of oil of olives and other simples. Imagine herbs, flowers, roots, etc., the way of making them is this. Having bruised the herbs or flowers you would make your oil of, put them into an earthen pot, into two or three handfuls of them. Pour a pint of oil. Cover the pot with a paper. Set it in the sun about a fortnight or so according as the sun is in hotness. Then, having warmed it very well by the fire, press out the herb very hard in the press and add as many more herbs to the same oil. Bruise the herbs, I mean not the oil, in like manner. Set them in the sun as before, the oftener you repeat this, the stronger your oil will be. At last, when you conceive it strong enough, boil both herbs and oil together till the juice be consumed, which you may know by its bubbling, and the herbs will be crisp. Then strain it while it is hot and keep it in a stone or glass vessel for your use. As for chemical oils, I have nothing to say here. The general use of these oils is for pains in the limbs, roughness of the skin, as also for ointments and plasters. Chapter 6 of electuaries. I shall prescribe one general way of making them up. As for ingredients, you may do them as you please and as you find occasion. That you may make electuaries when you need them, it is requisite that you keep always herbs, roots, flowers, and seeds ready, dried in your house, that so you may be in a readiness to beat them into powder when you need them. It is better to keep them whole than beaten, for being beaten, they are more subject to lose their strength because the air soon penetrates them. If they be not dry enough to beat into powder, when you need them, dry them by a gentle fire 
till they are so. Having beaten them, sift them through a fine screen that no great pieces may be found in your electuary. To one ounce of your powder at three ounces of clarified honey, this quantity I hold to be sufficient. If you would make more or less electuary, vary your proportion accordingly. Mix them well together in a mortar and take this for a truth. You cannot mix them too much. The way to clarify honey is to set it over the fire in a convenient vessel till the scum rise. And when that is taken off, it is clarified. The usual dose of cordial electuaries is from half a dram to two drams of purging electuaries from half an ounce to an ounce. The manner of keeping them is in a pot. The time of taking them is either in a morning fasting and fasting an hour after them or at night going to bed three or four hours after supper. Chapter 7 Of Conserves The way of making conserves is twofold, one of herbs and flowers, the other of fruits. Conserves of herbs and flowers are thus made, if you make your conserves of herbs, such as scurvy grass, wormwood, rue, and the like, take only the leaves and tender tops, for you may beat your heart out before you can beat the stalks small, and having beaten them, weigh them, and to every pound of them add three pounds of sugar. You cannot beat them too much. Conserves of fruits, as of barberries, sloes, and the like, is thus made. First, scald the fruit. Then, rub the pulp through a thick sieve made for the purpose, called a pulping sieve. You may do it for a knead with the back of a spoon. Then take this pulp thus drawn and add to it its weight of sugar, and no more. Put it into a pewter vessel, and over a charcoal fire. Stir it up and down, till the sugar be melted, and your conserve is made. Thus you have the way of making conserves. The way of keeping them is in earthen pots, the dose is usually the quantity of a nutmeg at a time, morning and evening, or when you please. Of conserves, some keep for many years, as conserves of roses, others but a year, as conserves of cowslips and the like. Have a care of the working of some conserves presently after they are made. Look to them once a day and stir them about. Conserves of wormwood have got an excellent faculty at that sport. You may know when your conserves are almost spoiled by this. You shall find a hard crust at top with little holes in it. Chapter 8 Of Preserves Preserves are sundry sorts, and the operation of all being somewhat different, we will handle them all apart. These are preserved with sugar, flowers, fruits, roots, barks. Flowers are very seldom preserved. I never saw any that I remember. 
save only cowslip flowers. That was a great fashion in Sussex when I was a boy. It is thus done. Take a flat glass. Strew them on a laying of fine sugar. On that, a laying of flowers. And on that, another laying of sugar. On that, another laying of flowers. So do till your glass be full. Then tie it over with a paper. And in a little time, you shall have very excellent and pleasant preserves. There is another way of preserving flowers, namely, with vinegar and salt, as they pickle capers and broom buds, but as I have little skill in it myself, I cannot teach you. Fruits, esquinces, and the like are preserved two ways. Boil them well in water, and then pulp them through a sieve, as we showed you before. Then, with the like quantity of sugar, boil the water they were boiled in into a syrup pound of sugar to a pint of liquor. To every pound of this syrup and four ounces of the pulp. Then boil it with a very gentle fire to their right consistency. Which you may easily know if you drop a drop of it into a trencher, if it be enough, it will not stick to your fingers when it is cold. 